This yeah, well, no, no, you don't know if you don't ask questions. Well, true, true, and everybody's entitled to ask. I call this one again. <laughs> now, since I'm still, I have still a little, little bit of work to do on this one, please, if you find that there's a bit of roughnesses in this, excuse that, because it's not quite finished. <laughs> or maybe it is. Uh, but, but I call this one the, the Retreat of God. Now, that might be only the retreat of God for me, and maybe it's only a metaphorical title, but that's the title as of now. Where is our once firm religion, now when we need it most? Crackling gibberish in the shade like a confused, blinded ghost. The very one we dared to hope might do as it had preached, speak up against the rich, the cruel we find has overreached has made the all-too-human choice let spirit slip away, forgot that such has consequence, the time is here to pay. The house of God's half empty now, those present half asleep. Has habit, duty, brought them here? Who knows? But the cliff is steep that leads to closing of the doors for one last dusty time. I hope I never see that day. It will darken my one last prime. That's one of the rough parts I'd have to think of. <laughs> but that darkness seems approaching, deny it as we will. So, turn off the lights, accept the dark, and that we're mere roadkill? No, no. Abandon now, while still there's time, what never should have rooted a religion where man meant man, and women were excluded. For that is where the crisis lies, perversion springs from there, demeaning half the human race, which regula regulations bear. In all the sunstroke religions, where women have little place. What are these men afraid of yet? Millen millennia's branded trace? And it is with us still today to blight so many lives, the scourge of morals gone away that might have civilized. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, it is only written, not, not, um, not uh, typed. So, uh, and it is with us still today to blight us so many lives, the scourge of morals gone awry, not, not away, gone awry that might have civilized. Because it's an engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you really think that Christ wanted to subdue Please, them? Mark, Mark, can you wait? Yeah, please. Questions uh, afterwards, Mark. Afterwards. Yeah, go on. I, I'm only saying, look. No, no. I, 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 I mean, subdue my, subdue okay. women. Um, and the pagan, the pagan value women? didn't actually exonerate them, but actually subdue them. Which the women were the ones who were around the cross yes. and came to the tomb. Yeah. And when men were the ones who denied and denied. No, I'm only Christ. asking questions. I'm sorry, I don't what? mean to interrupt you. No, no, you're not. Sorry, I'm sorry. You're not denying, uh, you're not interrupting at all. You're not taking task in here. And what was your question again? The question is do you think that Christ subdued women or exonerated them? Well, exonerated or made them, made them, them, made them known to men. <laughs> He didn't either. He, he, um, it, was a th it was a thing of the time and place. Uh, you see, as I said there, the sunstroke religions. I mean that. All these religions, uh, be they Jewish, Christian or Muslim, they all come out of the desert place. The desert, they were all gone crazy. <laughs> the heat from all crazy. <laughs> Go crazy in the more mountains, and it would be a desert. You think so? Crazy in the more mountains? Yeah, but it's still crazy. Oh, well, look at this. Well, no, 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 no. there is, of course. Here now, watch the more mountains. There's one there's a point to answer when you open up them. A loss of face. Far away, northwards from here, a body rotted and half-eaten 
is dragged to land by moist, unloving hands. A sad but simple set ceremony. For any who might hear or wish to know, it is believed that it was once a man, one who did not live to see his top death deathbed, a faceless man with no past worth the guessing, since no one knew his name. One thing was clear, he was no Lysidas in azure coral grottoes strewn by mighty ocean swell, no poet's hand stretched out to reach him safe to show. In hissing reeds his epitaph endures the space of changing tides. Strange men have gathered him from one bleak sodden grave to one both dry and deep, as bleak but much, much more discreet. The sun makes pictures on the water and graves are brushed by dancing meadow grasses. His friends, if friends he had, if friends there were, did not appear to care. He lay unclaimed by any foolish man since no one knew his name. Buried him deep, hired hands. Let shoveled earth confirm his isolation. In his turn, doubtful, each of four true clergymen transcends his prejudice and sanctifies the work. Seals up the corpse, fixes its place, lays claim to what he thinks is his to save. The very soul is parceled, crimped, divided, to meet demands of many creditors. They could not understand that he might be, perhaps, contented in his shifting bed of reeds and no more said. It was a sad, a quiet ceremony since no one knew his name. Here your chapter ends, half man, a pauper's grave at public expense. How insignificant the mark you make, yet, do you lie less easily for that, freed as you are from enemies and friends and those who cut you off in the simmering of your youth? You died not weeks or days ago. Your tide began to ebb in that dim hour when cold, unblinking eyes, looking you up or down, deciphered you as prod or pape, forgot you were a man. It has become a cruel, a bitter ceremony. Now, I, thinking of that kind of, uh, of, uh, what would I say, uh, a war as it, as it was, and thank God that kind of a war has simmered down, and please God has ended, although we'll wait and see. I, I, um, I have at home, my mother was from Talbert, across the Shannon, and she died 42 years ago this year, at the age of 49, very young age for anyone to die. Her sister is still alive at the age of 92, in Wolverhampton, teaching yoga. <laughs> how, strange, how strange the way families go and the way life is. And her other sister is quite alive in, in, in New York at the age of 89. And it has always, you know, given me food for thought. Why, 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 why? And those kind of questions you can never answer, ever, ever. But among all the photos uh, that my mother had, some of the photos were of her two brothers who joined the British Navy because there was nothing in Talbot. And my sister, in, my, my, my aunt in Wolverhampton, she has no illusions at all about the Ireland of that time. It was a mean, horrible, scummy country. There was nothing. They had to go. And the Talbot and Limerick, of course, were joined by the Limerick Steamship Company. Uh, it was up and down the Shannon at that time. I had a lot of photos of the, the boats coming up and down, uh, taken from the battery in Tarbert, the, the ramparts of the battery, which is gone now because that was demolished to get the power station built. I won't have a lot of photos, but I have a few. But I have quite a number of my uncle in the various ships that he served in in the British Navy. Now, I wrote this poem for uh, my uncle because he had to put up with a lot of, how do I say, prejudice 
in the British Navy because he was an Irishman. And eventually he made it, no, never made it to a big, uh, a, what would I say, rank, only to chief petty officer. Which for an Irishman, I suppose, was a big rank. Yeah. 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 You, you were not going to make it any higher because you were only, you were only an Irishman. <laughs> my mother went to England too as a nurse with my aunt, but she hated England. She came home and died of cancer in 1969, 42 years ago. But here is my, uh, the, the poem from my uncle based on all those photos I had. I only met him once. He came home just once. He never talked of all the places, all the ships he'd seen, of houses shattered in Valletta, men hanging, almost seated, hands or eye in gestures of Iberian despair. He never boasted of Dunkirk, bared no opinion on the fall of Singapore, or on his friend eaten by sharks of Java, on all the men who died with scarce a backward scream overboard on the bitter Biscay crossing, those fraying threads I had to gather for myself and stitch them into the dishevelled fabric of my own much humbler co covering. All those threads had rattled long, long past, when he once faithfully intervened in my affairs, thwarted my father's order to stand an unoffending beetle about its business on the kitchen floor. I, complying with unthinking boyish plea, was stopped, surprised with live and let him live. Restraining finger, not another word. A Singapore falls every other day, and men, men still struggle, catch or miss their boat. But men may be, one may be remembered for other littler battles too. A man who sees a beetle's point of view must have achieved a wide and telling vision, a point of vantage built on private griefs, and there has been enough, enough of killing. Now, my wife asked me before I came out tonight, would I I read this for her. Just to. Uh, to uh, <laughs> because. If I, if I can find it, uh, sorry. Uh, she, she has never heard me telling a story in all the years, in case things might get too serious. <laughs> so, the title of this was House Bills Touched, House Prices Tumble. <laughs> Ever since your fine block wall touch it past the fifth row, Mary, no, no longer any danger of collapse, alas. The walls are so straight and level. It's obvious that the local menfolk are getting in their full night's sleep. Red-eyed, they consult in huddles when they should be watching television, playing soccer in their armchairs, or fondling dangerous dark pint glasses. I tell you, construction must stop. You'll have to let me get one block in there soon, just a little one, please. The manly honour of this whole estate, not, to me, not mentioning the market value of the house, is dancing to the tinkle of your throwel. By such constructive gestures as forsook the great foundations of society, you know. 